Now, I want to ask you to go with me again to the fourth chapter of the second book of Kings. And here in the fourth chapter, I want us to talk about Elisha and the Shunammite woman. I hope you are also recognizing in just the first few weeks in the second book of Kings how many women feature prominently in the narrative. Uh, It is called the book of Kings, but there is much more about the common people than about the kings, certainly in the first nine, ten chapters of the book. And as we've already begun to discover, women feature very prominently in the narrative. Uh, We were talking about a woman last week, weren't we? We were talking about a poor woman. Uh, This afternoon, we're not talking about a poor woman. We're talking about a wealthy woman. Uh, Last week, we were talking about uh, a woman who had been blessed with two children. Uh, This afternoon, we're going to be thinking about a woman who had no children at all. Uh, Last week, we uh, talked about a woman whose uh, husband died. Though he was uh, a faithful man, a godly man, a servant of the Lord, he died. And this evening, we're going to be talking about how a woman's son died, how a woman's child died. And so there are all sorts of women that are spoken of in the second book of Kings. And those of you who may have imbibed uh, a little bit of our host culture uh, when it says to us that uh, women uh, are not regarded in Scripture uh, uh, in the high way and manner in which they uh, deserve uh, to be regarded. Well, there's a Hebrew word for that. Uh, nonsense. Just complete and utter nonsense. Because last week we saw a, a widow and how carefully the man of God sought to lovingly minister uh, to her. She was not abused. She was not exploited. She was not taken advantage of. But she was shown a way through which she could use what she already had at her disposal uh, for the meeting of her own needs and for the meeting of the needs of her sons. And here, this woman, this Shunammite Woman who lived in a place called Shunem. Uh, Why, she's a quite remarkable woman indeed. Uh, In fact, there's certainly more said in this text about her than there is about her uh, husband. Uh, She, like uh, Priscilla in the New Testament, uh, is uh, identified as someone who had a husband as. Priscilla most assuredly did, Aquila and Priscilla. But it seems that about two-thirds of the time, this Shunammite woman is mentioned and spoken of and dealt with in the text more so even than her husband. And in fact, it doesn't even say that this is the wife of a wealthy man. It says that there dwelled there in Shunam a wealthy Woman, And so it seems that one day, as uh, Elisha was passing by, uh, she offered him some food. And it must have been quite uh, a nice meal, uh, because whenever he passed that way, he turned in and ate some of her food. And so she then makes an interesting proposition to her husband. Uh, She said, I perceive that this is a holy man of God who keeps 
continually passing uh, our way. So I suppose that we ought to get planning permission and do a loft conversion uh, because she suggests that they make a small room on the roof with walls and that they not only make the room, but that they furnish it. And the furnishings are specified, a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Not too much, not too little, just enough. And it can be that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. Well, now you can just imagine with a setup like that, Elisha began going by there a bit more often. He knew he had a place to sleep. He knew he always had a meal waiting to be prepared. And if he needed a bit of quiet, he could go to the loft conversion. Or if he wanted to sit with the woman and her husband, he could talk and engage in edifying conversation. One night, he's there at the house of the Shunammite woman, and he's thinking about the great kindness which has been shown to him. Could I simply remind you, brothers and sisters, never to take things for granted, to never have a spirit or an attitude of entitlement, but to actually acknowledge the kindness of the Lord and the goodness of the Lord and also to express appreciation to those through whom the Lord has blessed you and helped you. And so he invites this woman through his servant Gehazi to make a request. Perhaps she would have a word spoken on her behalf to the king. Perhaps she would have a word spoken on her behalf uh, to the commander of the army. But it seems that this woman is satisfied with her lot in life. And she simply says, I dwell among my own people. But Elisha wants to know, surely there's something that this woman needs. Surely there's something that this woman needs. Desires, and Gehazi points out the blindingly obvious. This woman doesn't have a son. And not only does this woman not have a son, her husband is now old. And it would appear to all the world that this woman, though rich and wealthy, in many other ways, will never have what she might really desire in her heart, and that is a son. So Elisha invites uh, the woman, and he tells her that about uh, that time, the following year, that she would embrace a son. And the news was it was almost too good to be true. In fact, uh, she thought perhaps that maybe this man of God was lying to her, that he was deceiving her in some way. But he wasn't. And just as he had said about that same time, the next year she bore a son. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. It is a reminder that God knows the unutterable desires of our heart and that God knows the inexpressible prayers of our hearts. And he gives us even that which we might be unwilling for whatever reason to ask for. So that would be a wonderful place just to say, and they all lived happily ever after. 
but there's more to the story. The child grew. And as the child grew, he one day went out where his father was working among the reapers. And quite suddenly it seemed that he had a very serious headache. He cries out to his father, Oh, my head, my head. And the father says to one of the servants that he should be uh, taken to his mother. And so he's taken to his mother and he's sat there on her lap until noon. And then he died. And so you can just imagine the roller coaster of emotions that this woman uh, has, has been on. You know, at, at, at one minute she's knowing this wonderful thrill, this wonderful joy of having this long-desired and long-sought-after son. And now she is having to come to grips with the sudden reality and sudden death of that son. She uh, placed uh, the son there on the bed of Elisha in that, in that loft conversion, in that rooftop room that she had had prepared for him. And she said to her husband, uh, get me one of the donkeys. And she set off for Mount Carmel where uh, Elisha was. And now immediately they wanted to know, now why are you doing this? Why are you going after the prophet? It's not a new moon time for one of the annual feasts or festivals, nor is it even a Sabbath. Uh, she said, all is well. Now take note of those words. They will appear. All is well. Isn't that a remarkable statement to make when your life as you know it is seemingly falling apart? Isn't that a remarkable statement to make when the thing that is nearest and dearest to you in life is suddenly taken from you to say, all is well. But she saddled uh, the donkey and I wouldn't have wanted to be in her way that day because she said to her servant, urge the animal on and do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. And so she set out and came to the man of God on Mount Carmel. Now he saw her coming from some distance and he sent his servant Gehazi. And the servant of Gehazi was to run and meet her and he is to ask of her the following questions. And I'll just show the questions there to you in verse 26. Run at once to meet her. Say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? And she answered... In the same words that she had previously uttered in verse 23, all is well. And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. Gehazi tried to push her away. But Elisha said, no, obviously she's in bitter distress. The Lord's hidden from me the reason. And she begins to pour out her heart. Did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And Elisha interrupts. He has Gehazi go and she says, well, I'm not content just for Gehazi to go. I want you to go. And Elisha comes. He goes into that room. He shuts the door behind the two of them and he prayed to the Lord. He went up, he lay on the child, he put his mouth on his mouth, eyes on his eyes, hands on his hands. He stretched himself out upon him and the flesh of the child became warm. And he got up and walked once back and forth in the house and he went up and stretched himself upon the child again. And this time the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he said, good Gehazi, his servant, called the Shunammite, and he called her. And when she had come to him, he said, pick up your son. And she came not and picked up her son in the first instance. She came and fell at his feet, bowing 
to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. That's an absolutely remarkable uh, account. And I'm just astounded by it. It's one of the lengthiest passages having to do with one uh, event. It's actually called a pericope. Uh, it's the, the lengthiest of these uh, that we'll find virtually anywhere uh, in the entire book of Second Kings. So it's absolutely remarkable what is taking place here. Now, what I thought I might do this afternoon is something intensely personal. And something at the same time, I trust, will be immensely helpful. I think it's very important from time to time for us to do an honest self-assessment. It's very helpful from time to time for us to do an honest self-check. And this afternoon, we are afforded the opportunity of doing that by looking at those three questions posed to uh, the Shunammite woman from Elisha through Gehazi, his servant. And I want you to recognize that because these words are included in the pages of Holy Scripture and because these words uh, were spoken by one of God's appointed prophets and because they have been preserved for us in the Word of God, that they are recorded here for our blessing, our benefit, our encouragement, our help. And so I want you to look back there, if you will, to verse 26, and I want you to look at these questions. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is all well with your husband? Is all well with the child? Now, let me put those questions to you in hopes that God helping you, you will be able to answer with the Shunammite woman with those words, all is well. The first question this afternoon is this, is it well with you? Is it well with you. How are you doing as a person? I know that often we are encouraged as Christians, and especially Christians in fellowship with one another in a local church, to think about others. In fact, not so long ago, Pastor Steve led us through a very helpful series on the one another passages in the New Testament. And we were encouraged not to think only on our own things, but also to think on the things of others. But even if you think about that verse from Philippians, does it not infer that we are to think on our own things? If it says to think not only on your own things, but also on the things of others, does it not clearly infer that we do, and in fact that we should think on our own things? We should consider ourselves. We should think about ourselves, we should be prepared to answer the question, is it well with you? How are you doing as a person? Now, what's interesting to me is that this woman seemed to be doing well 
before, during, and after her crisis. Here is a woman who was obviously disappointed because she had not been able to conceive and give birth to a son. But nonetheless, she made no request for a son. She was content. Here is a woman who, when she was given a son, she, of course, rejoiced in that and was thankful for that. But she had professed to be well before she ever conceived. And then, is it not the case that even after that thing, which was nearest and dearest to her heart, had suddenly been taken away, that she would still say, all is well. Now, is this just one of those polite answers that you give to a question? Well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. Are you well? Yes, I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, how are you today? Oh, I'm, 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 doing, I'm doing well. How are you? Liars, all of us, liars. We, we, we know about those type of questions and we've all given those type answers. But I don't think that that is the way in which this woman is responding. I think that this woman really meant it when she said, all is well. Perhaps she meant it because her wellness was not based on her circumstances. Her wellness was not based on how things appeared to be going. Her wellness was not based on whether or not all of the desires of her heart were fulfilled or not. This is a woman who quite obviously knew and loved the Lord and had found that he really and truly is sufficient. She certainly enjoyed her wealth. She certainly sought to make use of her wealth in serving others. But I don't think her well-being was even based on her wealth and riches. I would imagine had Elisha said, well, your son can be well again and your son can live again if you part company with your wealth, she would have gladly given it all. This woman could say, it is well, because this woman knew the God of the Bible, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and she knew that all of his ways are perfect, and she knew that all that he does is right. Can I ask you this afternoon, do you believe that all of the ways of God are perfect and that everything he does is right? If so, even midst life's greatest tragedy, you will be enabled to say, all is well. It's interesting that he begins with the woman. He doesn't begin with the husband. He doesn't begin with the child. He begins with her. It's sort of like if you have the opportunity to take a late summer holiday this year and you're going to go somewhere by air and you make your way to uh, the Luton Airport and you finally make your way through uh, the queue and you're finally seated there on the airplane and it's time for the in-flight instructions 
and they're going to advise you what you should do in the unlikely event of the loss of cabin pressure. They're going to advise you that when the mask drops from above, not that you put one first on your husband or that you put one first on your child or grandchild, but that you first put the mask on yourself. How are you doing as a person? Are you joyful or sorrowful? Are you bitter, resentful? Are you content, dissatisfied? Are you angry? Or have you accepted your lot in life? Are you at peace? within, in your own heart, in your own mind. Any anxious thoughts, any worries, any cares, any nervous apprehension, any anxious foreboding. Maybe you're waiting for the box, all of the above. How are you doing as a person? Most of the time, we're never asked the question. And often, when we are asked the question, the person asking it doesn't really want to hear the answer. But the Lord, before whom the secrets of men's heart are laid bare, says to you through his word, This afternoon. How are you getting on? How are you as a person? Is it well with you? I pray by God's grace, by his mercy and power, that you will be enabled to answer, all is well. But he didn't stop with this woman. He asked her, not only is it well with you, but is it well with your husband? So it's not only a question of how are you doing as a person, but but how are you doing as a marriage partner? You may have been married five years. You may have been married five decades. You may get along very well. You may be at each other's throat a lot of the time. Uh, There there may have been uh, reports uh, to the relevant authorities of of, uh, uh, UFOs uh, in the vicinity of your house. That is to say that flying saucers have uh, appeared uh, in your house neighborhood. How are you doing? Not just as a person, but as a marriage partner. The, um, the man and his wife uh, were celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. All of the family had come and gone and they're, they're left alone in the front room. They'd already taken their hearing aids out. And they're sitting there trying to have a few last words of conversation before they turn in for the night. The man turns to his wife and says, "Um, I'm I'm proud of you. Uh, He seldom said nice things like that. And... uh, she couldn't make out what he had said, so she said, sorry, I, I, I didn't hear. And he said, I'm, 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 I'm proud of you. And she said, sorry, you'll have to say that again. And he said, I'm trying to say I'm, I'm proud of you. 
And she said, oh, I'm tired of you too. (laughs) Surely that wasn't anyone you know. Um, Some people are married uh, for better or worse. But it seems that there's more worse than better. Some are, are married for richer or poorer, but it tends to the poorer side of things. Some married, you know, in sickness or in health, and we're still sort of waiting for that health part to arrive. How are you doing as a marriage partner? I wonder, um, particularly in light of Pastor Steve's ministry this morning, as he was speaking to us from 1 Peter about the wife and the husband and the husband and the wife. If you found that as, um, as challenging as I did. What do you do especially if you're one of those marriage partners whose spouse does not know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. How is that going? It's difficult to maintain a consistent, credible Christian witness in front of someone to whom you are married when they don't know the baptism of the Spirit that we call salvation and the fruit of the Spirit, which is the result of the ongoing sanctification of the Spirit in our life. And sometimes people struggle in their marriage. They don't feel they're on the same wavelength. Well, if the book is to be believed, they're not even on the same planet. So how are you getting on? Not just as a person, but as a partner. Are there long-term issues that can't be discussed because they always give rise to a major argument. Is it sometimes like making your way through a minefield, one false step, an imminent disaster? How are you doing as a marriage partner? This woman said, all is well. What, was she just saying that because that's what she expected God or wanted to hear? Was she just saying that because, you know, that's just how you respond to those sorts of questions? You can't be vulnerable enough and transparent enough and open enough to, to answer that. How are you getting on with your husband? How are you and your wife, you know, getting along with one another these days? It's a real question. The Lord wants to know. The reality is the Lord does know. The Lord wants you to say. And what about the the child? Is it well with child. How are you doing as a parent? Oh, it's not just how are you doing as a parent when the children are young, and obviously this this boy was still quite young because uh, he, he followed his father into the field, but when he was ill, he had to be taken back, and when he was taken back, he was not put in his bed, he was put in his mother's lap. It's obvious, you know, he, he, he's still quite... He's still quite young. And being, being the parent of a young child, uh, Henry and Pauline will pay particular attention to this part of the message, well, it's not as glamorous as it looks, is it? Sometimes quite difficult. Sometimes it's quite hard. And sometimes you don't, you don't really know how you're doing. You've never done it before. 
And sometimes you don't know how you've done until it's too late. And then some of you have lived long enough to know that the only thing more difficult than than parenting younger children is parenting older children. And I'm not just talking about those teenage years where there might be, you know, a bit of teenage uh, adolescent rebellion. But what do you do when the children that you brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord no longer seem to care about the things of God. You you clung to what you thought was a promise. In reality, it was only ever a proverb. But you clung to what you thought was a promise that, you know, if you bring up your child in the way they should go, that when they are old, they will not depart from it. And what's happened They are old, they've reached maturity, and they have departed from it. And it's not just that they don't go to church anymore, or that they don't go to the church that you would want them to go to, or that they don't really read their Bible, or they don't really pray. It's the fact that they're now raising your grandchildren in that sort of environment where the Lord and his word is not honored and his worship and fellowship with his people is not valued. And that's just the reality, is it not, for many people? What do you do when the child has the problem and they are too old and too big to be placed in your lap? And they have the problem, the difficulty, the distressing situation that they have to work through themselves. Anyone have any experience with that? I'm sure those of us who have children and some maybe even grandchildren in adulthood, we know about that. Often when the child is young and unwell, we, we, we think and sometimes we even say that we would trade places with them. And we, we really mean it. We, we, we would take their place in the sick bed. Uh, we, we would be the one who would go to the doctor or we would go into hospital. And then when they become an adult, we think, I would have my limb amputated rather than yours. I would take that cancer if I could. I would bear the pain of that broken relationship and that divorce. I, I, I wish I could take care of the rebellious child. I, I, I would gladly take bankruptcy for you. I wish you didn't have to go through that. How are you? How are you doing as a person, as a marriage partner, as a parent? This woman responded to all three questions. All is well. And I don't know if you've noticed... The remarkable thing about it is that nothing was well. Everything was wrong. Here is a woman, if she's honest, she's embittered because I didn't ask for this. I didn't sign up for this. This is not what I wanted. I told you not to do this. I told you not to deceive me. And her husband? Well, why is he almost only a minor player in the story? Why isn't he more of a spiritual leader in the home? Why wasn't it his idea to build the accommodation 
for the prophet? Why isn't he the one who's going and making the request when the son has died? Why is he always deferring to me? Why am I always the one having to take a lead? Why is he so casual and lackadaisical about it all? And the child, I loved him. Of course I loved him. But I didn't ask for him. And I knew it was too good to be true. And now it is proven that it was too good to be true. And he's dead. She says all is well, but in reality nothing was well. Or was it? This woman knew God. This woman enjoyed right relationship with God. This woman was an heir of the promises of God. This is a woman who could cling and hold to the truth of God's providence in the lives of His covenant people. All is well is not a statement of denial. She's not denying the reality of her situation. All is well is a statement of faith and confidence. And why that bit from chapter 8? What does that have to do with anything? It just goes to show you that what God did yesterday is a really good grounds of hope and confidence for what he will do today and tomorrow. Uh, The name Horatio Spafford will do something uh, for some of you. Horatio Spafford was a uh, wealthy man. He lost a lot of his wealth in the great Chicago fire in the 19th century in the United States of America. He decided in the aftermath of that fire that he would take his family to Europe for an extended holiday and perhaps even to consider the possibility of immigrating to Europe. There was a last-minute change of plans, and his wife was sent ahead with the children. There was a horrible storm at sea. The ship would sink and beloved members of his family would die. His wife would send him a telegram when she safely reached land telling him that all was lost. Amazing. She didn't say all is well. She said all is lost. He began his journey across the Atlantic and when they came near the place where his children had perished at sea, he penned the words, When peace like a river attends all my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. 
you, you, you see, Horatio Spafford didn't write that hymn seated at a desk with a mug of coffee at hand. Horatio Spafford didn't pen those words sitting in his studio writing hymns. Horatio Spafford didn't write that hymn on a mountaintop of inspiration where he had gone on retreat to spend time with the Lord. He wrote that facing the most profound sorrow he had ever faced in his life. And in the midst of it all, he was enabled to say, with the Shunammite woman of old, it is well with my soul. I don't know how it is with you as a person this afternoon. Uh, You may be feeling your age. You may be struggling with declining physical, emotional health, and you may even be struggling spiritually. But the wellness of your soul never has been based on you. It's always and only been based on what God has done for you in Christ. And if you're honest... Your marriage may not be all that you would have desired for it to be. It may have been fraught with all manner of unanticipated difficulties and unanticipated struggles. It may have ended in divorce. It may have ended in death. But you know, the reality is the believer is a part of the bride of Christ. And we have the wonderful hope of a marriage feast to come and of a marriage union with Christ, the husband of his bride. And you may have had your struggles with your children or you may not have had children. And you might have said, if only I could have had those struggles. But for you, it's been the struggles of not having them. And you might wonder, how am I doing as a parent or as a grandparent? Or if only I knew. You may be like my friend uh, Daniel Shway and his wife, Lily. Circumstance and choice conspired to keep them from living together for a number of years, though married. And by the time they were enabled to live together as husband and wife, the years for childbearing were gone. There's few, if any, people on this island who have any more spiritual children than Daniel and Lily Shway. You can be embittered by what you don't have or you can joyfully use the circumstances that you do have for God's glory. At the end of the day, you will not stand before God and in the final analysis be judged on your merits as a father or a mother. But you will be judged on the merits of the son of the father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you know and love the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and if you were seeking to follow and serve him, regardless of how things are going for you as a person, partner, or parent, you can honestly say, all is well. And you can say, all is well, 
because it is well with your soul. Why don't we stand and sing those words together just now? Thank you.